Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live today. It's Saturday, November the 17th, 2012. Somebody said it's six weeks to Christmas. I'm getting excited already. Our topic today is the featured teacher, and our special guest today is Stephen Davis. For those of you who are new to the session, and just a reminder for those who've been here a while, we do have a live binder, which is a great curation tool. So all the links for today's session are going to be in that live binder. And Peggy often drops in the uh, link to the live binders during the show so that you can go back and look at it or bookmark it for future reference, because you're going to find links to all the resources that Stephen's sharing today in the live binder. As well as that, we do have a website, live.classroom20.com. And you'll find on the archives and resources page a complete link to a blog post with uh, an audio file, an MP4 file that you can embed in any uh, website so that you can share it with others, uh, as well as the full Blackboard Collaborate recording. Just a quick uh, thank you very much to Tammy Moore, who is in the chat. She usually provides closed captioning, but I believe that function or option is not working today. So maybe you can just give me a, uh, is that correct, Tammy? So we welcome you every Saturday, and it's a treat to have you with us. Um, so they're supposed to fix it tonight. Yes, we're having an update. As well, we have Tammy Moore, excuse me, Lori Moffat, who is our backup moderator, and she'll be helping collect the questions a little later on for the show. Thank you again, uh, Lori, for being with us. And move on to the map. This is where you get everybody busy. Remember the laser pointer to the left of your whiteboard in this map here? Click on that laser pointer, drag it across uh, the map, and let's take a look at the connections that we have across the globe. If you can't make that laser pointer work, then go ahead and type in the chat where you are located. It's just fun to see where everyone is. I'm in St. Catharines, Ontario, California. Peggy's in Phoenix, Arizona. And the rest you'll have to type in. I have a terrible message, memory sometimes, about where everyone is located. Right, Azerbaijan, Illinois. Wonderful. Thank you very much, everyone, for taking part in that little bit of fun. So I'm going to move on quickly to our poll question. So now you're going to be voting with that um, icon that's just under your name, yes or no. So the first question is, does your school have full participation in Web 2.0 tools from all stakeholders in your school's community? So yes, if they do, and no, if they don't. So you can go ahead and vote. I think people have cast their ballots or they're going to answer via the chat. Here's the results of today's question, which is, for the most part, we're saying no, and uh, we're going to turn in between the other, and the people aren't able to vote in there. But you get a sense already, Stephen, for the answer to that question. Going to our next question is, do administrators on your campus have a Web 2.0 presence? Yes, if you do, no, if you don't, that's a green check for yes and red X for no. Let's see what the results are for this question. Split here, 30-30-30, that's an interesting uh, break today. I think people are still having a little difficulty with that voting option. Our third question today. I think most people can answer this one. Do you blog regularly, either personally or with your students? Just waiting for the votes to, to come in here. A few more people, and we'll take a look at the response to this question. So we have a few more people who are blogging, and others, little 40. If I was really exact on percentages, we're almost the same, 50-50 between each other. So, Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us in the poll questions. 
I'm going to have the opportunity now to move on to introduce our special guest today. Our feature teacher is Stephen Davis, and Stephen has been teaching middle school level for 14 years. I believe he's an English teacher, and he has a master's degree in middle level education, and he's originator of the mid-level ed hashtag on Twitter. He's quite busy because he's found another one as uh, well he enjoys uh, during this his time on Twitter, and he's going to share that uh, with you in a few minutes. He's a coordinator for EdCamp OCLA, and he's presented at the California League of Schools, the International Reform Symposium, Q Tech Fest, and TELL Conference, and he's a guest blogger. He's been a guest blogger and a... Hmm, got a slow dough. Sorry about that. He's been a guest blogger in Edutopia. He's edited a fictional book, book, and he is the creator of a teacher's desk. He says he enjoys photography, and he's a proud member of Edutalks. There's the, the hashtag I was missing on Instagram and Twitter. Stephen, I'm going to turn the mic over to you now to answer the newbie question. And if there's something else you'd like to add uh, about your background, please feel free to do that now. But uh, welcome. We're so pleased that you could be with us today. It took a lot of time getting ready with this slides, resources, a phenomenal uh, resource for everyone in today's session. So here's our question for you, Stephen. What does Web 2.0 mean to you, and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? Over to you, and you're going to turn your mic on, please. So I'm still waiting, Stephen. Uh, you don't have your mic active. Are you clicking on the talk button? It's just writing something. The talk button is not changing color. Hmm. There, that is there we go. There we go. Okay. Hello. Great. Welcome, okay. Stephen. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thank you. Thanks for having me, and thanks to everybody in the chat room uh, who have taken time out of their uh, Saturday to learn and uh, join this, join along with us. So um, what does Web 2.0 mean to me? Well, my school district's technology infrastructure and policies are really outdated, which makes much of the Web 2.0 difficult at a very basic level. However, on a different level, I've started to use 2.0 to show the positive potential that this concept can have for all things education. I'm trying to effect the change, not demand change. After all, my art is teaching. So I use Web 2.0 tools in my classroom for better efficiency on mundane tasks. Um, I, I use Digo on a daily basis, probably 50 times a day. Um, you know, to store bookmarks and to provide links for my students. Um, I like to use 2.0 stuff because it allows me to spend more time focusing on the students and building community and the shared experience with students and staff. Uh, frequently I'll have um, staff members or students ask me, oh, hey, do you know anything about concept X, Y, or Z? And I'll be like, no, but here's my delicious, or my Digo tag with all the links there. And they're like, oh, OK, cool. So uh, it, it helps out. Um, another aspect of my Web 2.0 um, thoughts is, and I'll be referring to this continually throughout my presentation, I have 205 students in my, um, in my classes. I have 36 students in six sections, 45-minute class periods. Laptops and iPads are pretty difficult to manage. Um, after passing out the tech and troubleshooting all the very minor issues, students would only have about 20, 25 minutes to work on whatever project they have before they have to return the tech. So it's really difficult to, to use a lot of the 2.0 uh, resources that many of us share on Twitter and um, in the blogosphere just because of my um, the infrastructure at my school and just the organizational structure. So almost all of my links and resources in this presentation, they have tutorials for the students to be able to, well, teach themselves. Um, I'm really big on equipping the students for, or helping the students equip themselves. So I'll point them in a certain direction, knowing that there's resources available for the students to be able to um, educate themselves and, and um, 
help themselves, basically. Same thing with like discussion forums and all that. Um, yeah, so there you go. <laughs> So you go ahead. I think you're going to run through the slides for us, right, Steve? Sure, sure. I, okay, sure. I didn't know if uh, you wanted me to finish anything else or say anything else there. Well, if, if you want to add whatever, <laughs> your, this okay. presentation is all about you, so you have the microphone. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks, everybody, for, for coming. And um, definitely check out uh, my blog at rushtheiceberg.com. Um, definitely, if you're in the Southern California area or you want to come to uh, California and enjoy some very nice uh, winter weather, uh, probably 70 degrees in January, come out to Ed Campos CLA. Uh, check the website for more details there. We're starting to get things organized and planned. It's going to be uh, an awesome year again this year. Um, also, check me out on uh, Instagram. I love taking pictures and posting them. and um, I'll be talking more about that later, but uh, check that out and um, participate on, on Twitter. Uh, ask me questions, send me links, uh, help me out, I'll help you out, and can help students all together. So my, my presentation is called Technology and the Developmental Needs of Young Adolescents. Um, I think that it's important that we focus on tech. I think that it's important that we focus on standards. I think that it's also important that we focus on the developmental needs of, of our, our students. Um, too often in the education reform debate, people talk about um, changing the way school is, you know, offering no homework, oh, don't have a desk, uh, which reminds me, don't forget to check out a teacher's desk .tumblr.com. Uh, it's a blog I started about the teacher's desks. So everybody is, there. I, get, I see all these passionate arguments and discussions about education reform, but it's almost all about pedagogy and nothing about the humanity of our teenagers. Um, they're just, they're, they're teenagers and they're very interesting and there's a lot of um, stuff happening with them. And so I think that it's important that we focus our lesson planning on that aspect, because the tech is going to fall into place, the standards are going to fall into place, um, your pedagogy, your whether you're a constructivist or a behaviorist or whatever, all that's going to fall into place, but the overarching thing here is the developmental needs. So, uh, young adolescents experience the drastic developmental changes that greatly affect their lives. Parents and teachers, well, we forget this because of the standards in the state testing hysteria. And that really, really saddens me. Um, I think we should focus on needs, not just standards. Uh, let's bring the humanity back to education. Uh, remember the developmental needs. And if you really think about it, any teacher can make a lesson into a standards masterpiece. Uh, whether that's No Child Left Behind, the Common Core State Standards, you're being observed, you're uh, writing a blog post, anybody can make that look perfect. So the developmental needs um, are the pies, uh, physical, intellectual, emotional, and social. So almost every single lesson plan that I do, I have in the back of my mind the, the pies here. Um, because I think that it's important that we challenge our students in this way. Um, so focusing too much on state standards creates lessons that are like a museum, perfect and static. Um, does your classroom look like this? Is, are your lessons like this? My lessons are kind of like this when I'm observed, to be honest, and that's okay. But do you present yourself on Twitter and on, in your blogs as, as having everything together and perfect and um, your lesson plans are just perfect? There's no problems with it. I don't think that that's reality. And I think that the pies help cr create lessons that are like a house that is lived in, comfortable and realistic. Um, hi, Lisa Babs. I saw you come in there teaching the soul. Hello. Um, so the PIES helps you create these lessons that are realistic and much more relevant to a teenager, uh, to an adolescent, and I think it's important we focus on that. Um, 
the metaphor I'm going to use throughout this presentation to to frame everything is a large sandbox. Um, and in the sandbox, the students are experiencing physical, intellectual, emotional, and social changes. So let's get into some of these. The physical needs of adolescents. No, this is not a picture of me as a child. Um, I wish. I was much skinnier and scrawnier. Um, adolescents, they experience more physical change than at any other time in their lives, except the first two years of their life. Um, Babies don't have um, cartilage in their knee until um, they're, they're teenagers. Um, the, all the changes that these teenagers are experiencing, um, it's insane. And how often do we forget that? Um, how often does our tech just become a digital worksheet all the time? But if we think about the physical needs that these students are changing, I think that helps us. So one of the um, options that I allow my students to do whenever we do a culminating um, project that shows what they know are all these links here. And, and I'm not saying that these are the only ones that could be physical. These are just some, and I'm hoping that you guys can all share um, different links here for you. Um, scavenger uh, is a really good website. Um, go on a scavenger hunt. Um, have the students run around and, and, and get outside and have fun. Um, you know, using map coordinates, uh, reading a map, um, math, also communication skills. There's a lot of really, really good stuff going on there. And uh, if you have any more questions, I highly recommend um, Diane Main, uh, dabbing in on Twitter. She'll she'll set you straight. She's the the queen of of scavengers and uh, of geocaching. She does a great, great job. Another one is YouTube, and I know that this one's really obvious, but I have, I've, I've had some students, they put their iPad on a music stand or on their desk, and they're in their bedroom playing the drums, and they're able to slow down, or they're able to watch their favorite drummer play, and they're able to watch and play the drums at the same time. Um, I talked with my dance teacher at my school, and she has some students who they'll go, and they'll go onto YouTube and find, um, dancing, dances, ballet, uh, modern dance, and all that stuff. And they watch it, and they could um, watch the dancer do one step of a dance move, and then they could practice that, and they can keep going back and forth. And um, I remember when I was a teenager, um, I had a, a VCR in my room, and so I had to do it with a VCR. I couldn't imagine having a iPad right there in front of me and be able to be able to have all these free videos that teach me how to play the drums or the guitar or any other thing. So I think that's a really good thing. Um, also, students can see breakdowns of you know basketball moves, of um, baseball um, plays, football plays, and all that stuff. The last two at the bottom there, Nike Boom and iFitness. Um, many of my students who um, leave me in eighth grade and go on into high school, uh, they talk about using this, the um, their iPad or I, iPhone apps, excuse me, their iPhone apps that um, allow them to uh, work out and have these professional athletes um, in their ear voicing them saying, 10 more, 10 more, and all that stuff. And so it's, it's really good and really interesting. And um, there's some customizable features there iFitness lets the students see um, the muscles that they're actually building. And so when they're out there working working out and whatnot, they can see the muscles that they're focusing on and whatnot. So I think there's some good stuff there. And I hope that in the um, chat, if you guys come up with any extra, any other ideas, please throw them out there because um, I'm sure there's millions out there. And um, I hope to uh, continue a list that I have. So adolescents tend to acknowledge and understand that their sandbox is getting bigger, but they focus more closely on specific areas and they move on to other areas of the sandbox. I know when I was growing up, my grandpa um, would always say that I was into a fad. Therefore, a while I was really into baseball cards. Well, six months later, I was really into uh, wristwatches. Then seven months later, I was really into um, drawing or whatever. And it used to drive my grandpa and my parents crazy that 
I would have these fads. And what they didn't understand, what I didn't understand until I got my master's in middle school is that that's just part of the discovery that the students are um, going through, that they're experiencing, where they they know that their sandbox is bigger, but they focus on one small area, and then they tend to master it, or they lose interest, and they go on to another area, and that's perfectly OK. And I think it's really important that we think about that, because it's really um, needed, especially when we're creating our, um, our lessons. So the intellectual needs of adolescents. Um, this is a lot of my students, they're, what? Um, I showed this to my students and they all laughed. And it was, it, was, it was good. They said, oh, that looks like so-and-so. Anyways, so um, adolescents begin to increase their ability to execute abstract thought processes. But this is often overlooked because it's not as obvious as the physical changes. Um, the physical changes are obvious and right there. and um, all the students understand that and see that, and so do the parents, and so do the teachers. But their brains are changing also. And I think that that is really, really important to, to remember, that inside, their brains are drastically changing. So I think it's really good, obviously, to challenge them. Now, the intellectual, that's really, really easy to find stuff. Um, so I kind of try to do some nuance and different stuff. Uh, Veritrasium. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, Veritrasium is basically a combination of uh, Khan Academy and Straight Magician, uh, but a million times better than both. Uh, what this guy does is he walks around and he talks to people and he basically is showing science um, concepts and principles to these um, people on the street, and they can totally see what's happening. And just the the way he explains things is phenomenal. And uh, I have a lot of students who go and they look at that, and uh, they're just blown away. And it brings another another aspect to the textbook. Then, of course, I have the onion. Um, now, some of that is not cool for school. Some of it is definitely not age appropriate. But if you have some students who you know can handle it and you're communicating with the parents, I think it's really important for the students to understand sarcasm and satire. And so show them the onion. Pull up some articles and um, you know, see if they can tell that it's totally joking around. Um, especially with this, um, with the transition to c the Common Core, with its focus on nonfiction texts, uh, I think that this would be really interesting to see what students would do with an op appropriate article from the Onion, and um, see if they're able to tell the nuance of sarcasm. Um, because I think we all understand as adults that when you're um, satirizing something or having sarcasm you know both sides of an issue. You understand all the minor and nuanced things about stuff. And um, I, I, I really think that that's important stuff. And so that helps them understand it, where they're exposed to it more. Because like Pink Floyd says, you know, the students don't need no dark sarcasm in the classroom. Um, but if we expose them to um, sarcasm that's not directed at the students, then I think that helps out. Um, Philosophy. There's um, this. The first one of the links is from Hoagie's Gifted website, where um, they have a lot of games that are more philosophical in nature. And um, I know a lot of our students are um, starting to ask the bigger questions. And um, I teach in a public school, so I can't really. Um, point them towards any religious um, websites. Uh, but I can point them to some philosophy websites where uh, they're talking about you know, some of the big questions. And so I think it's really important for students to see some of those. You know, the sandbox in which students, in which our adolescents played and discovered as a child is rapidly expanding. And that expansion produces greater joy and broader discoveries. But it also presents greater disappointments and greater sadness. How many of you have this student in your class? Every year I have one or two students who are 
symbolized by this student here. And I think that's great. Um, adolescents, we all know they exhibit an intensity and unpredictability because they're attempting to navigate their developing identity as an adult, but they're trying to maintain their credibility with their peers. Sorry about that, I just read a little bit of the stuff in the chat room. Um, This, this dichotomy and paradox of trying to become an adult but yet trying to stay relevant with their teens, that with their peers, that is just really, really tough. And there's, it's a roller coaster ride, and we need to um, be okay with that. Um, I, I kind of get frustrated when I hear teachers say, oh, it's the hormones of junior high kids. No, it's not the hormones. They're emotional beings, just like you or I. And we need to be sensitive to that and accept that. So here are some of the sites that I think help cultivate that for the students. Um, the first one is DeviantArt. Uh, I had never heard of this until a few years ago. A student um, sent me a link to her artwork on there. And I was just blown away with some of the stuff that not only she, but other students were able to do. Some of it is definitely not cool for school. But again, this goes back to my thing of where a lot of these tools I'm unable to use in my classroom because of the technology infrastructure and some of the policies that my school and district have. But these options are available to the students at home. And there's tutorials, and students can take risks and, and see that people do like their work. Or people disagree with their work, and they can um, express their emotional side there. Uh, Jamit is just an amazing resource. Um, it's an um, app that you can learn uh, music on. Uh, right now, I think it's just guitar, drums, bass guitar, and keyboards. But what it does, what is awesome about it is a student can download music from their favorite band. So let's say Rush, my favorite band. I'm seeing them in concert tonight. I can't wait. Woohoo! Anyways, they can download a Rush song. And they'll have the music notation there for them on their iPad, on their iPhone, or on the website. And the student can hit play, and they can play along with and learn to read music. But another cool thing is you can slow the tune down, slow the tempo down without affecting the pitch. And so that really helps students. Students are just amazed at that. The other awesome sauce for, for me, which I have on my iPhone, and I just do this frequently, is you can isolate just the drums. So you can take the guitars, bass, keyboards, everything out of, and vocals out of the mix, and you can just listen to the drums. And so you can really hear the nuance and really hear what the drummer is doing. Or if you isolate the guitars, you can just hear what the guitar is doing because a lot of the minor notes, well, not minor notes, but a lot of the uh, nuances get lost in the mix. And so it's really cool to uh, to see. It's it's phenomenal. I love it. And then Instagram, um, yeah, uh, what can I say about it? I love it. Um, I can do a whole presentation on um, iPhoneography. Um, one of the things that I see my students doing with um, Instagram is um, I'm having my students, they, they can go out and take pictures and um, use the filters both in Instagram and other um, applications to represent tone and mood or conflict and all the um, standards. But then also some students have shown me some of their um, pictures and I would see four or five pictures in a row that the the tone was definitely really sad, and I'd be I'd ask them, hey, were you really sad when that happened? And they'd be like, yeah, that's when my dog died. And I'd be like, do you see how that shows in your pictures? And they're like, oh my gosh! So they're able to see how their emotions come through in their photographs. And a lot of times they don't realize it until after the fact. They can go back and reflect after you know six months or so and see what they've done. Um, so I think Instagram and just iPhoneography in particular really, really allows students a lot of options.
this next slide I, I love because it totally symbolizes basically lunchtime at my school. Um, the adolescents, our teenagers, our middle school students, they want to be alone, but yet they want to be together. And so that uh, dichotomy often is really difficult and causes some problems. Um, they want to be a part of a group, yet they want to create their own identity. And so I think that we need to allow our students the opportunity to do that with the content in our classes. So hopefully some of these next sites can do that. Um, they desire to be in a group with more importance being placed on being associated with other adolescents rather than adults. Um, as they get older, the students are starting to see that, well, they're becoming an adult. They're like the double-headed Janus, where they're uh, half adult and half teenage or half teenager. And so they're starting to look at their peer groups as more as adults. And I think that we need to remember that while we're doing these lessons. Uh, Steve Hayes, I've never heard of STEAM. Uh, what is A, the arts? I think that's what that would be. But if that's the case, I'm definitely a proponent of STEAM over STEM. I'm going to look into that. Uh, thanks for mentioning that. So social needs and the technology. Um, I often focus heavily on the social aspects just because I want my students to be able to talk to each other and learn with each other. And um, I think that's just super, super important. Um, the first link there is um, Social Voice. Um, that's uh, John T. Spencer uh, of Education We Think, um, his phenomenal um, student website where his students are writing blog posts. And um, they, they're talented writers. And uh, they're doing a lot of really, really fun, interesting stuff. And um, it's not just, hey, my favorite movie is Thor. I really like the band One Direction. No, they're actually dealing with um, difficult issues, controversial issues. And I think that that's really, really um, excellent for these students to be able to uh, write about that. And so I, I, I highly suggest you check that out. Um, there's tons of other um, student blogs out there. Uh, I just really like the fit and finish of, of social voice, and any time I can promote what John Spencer does, I'm going to. Uh, the Chalk Walk, um, the, the Chalk Hospital is, is our children's hospital of Orange County here in Southern California. And um, you could do this with the, the um, Breast Cancer Awareness Walk, AIDS Walk, Leukemia Walk, any of the walks that are all over the country. And what happened, um, a student had, um, th this was for a different walk, but well, no, no, it was, it was for Chalk Walk. Um, a student's mom had cancer and was in the hospital um, getting, uh, recovering from surgery and chemotherapy and all that. And they had registered to take place in the Chalk Walk. Well, the mom couldn't go because she was still in the hospital. So what the student and her friends did, they had a flip video camera, remember those? They had a flip video camera and um, they did the walk holding the camera. And so they pretended that their mom was there and they were talking to her and showing her what was happening on the, um, during the walk. And then when the walk was over, they went back to the um, hospital and showed it to their mom. So the mom was able to watch um, the walk from her hospital bed, and it was it was super amazing, super cool that the students thought of that, and uh, I think that that's just phenomenal. And so I think that a lot of times students can do stuff with video and just stuff outside of the class that really helps them out. Then again, here's here we come back to Instagram. Um, I really think that. Um, it's interesting to think that how uh, these moments become memories. Um, one of my best friends, he he gets annoyed when I'm taking pictures, and and he gets annoyed when other people are taking pictures of their kids and running around, and he thinks that you should just be in the moment. And I agree, and I am in the moment when I'm taking pictures, and I know my students are in the moment when they're taking pictures, and if we judge the pictures that our students are taking and saying, oh, they shouldn't be taking those pictures. Obviously, there's a lot they shouldn't be. But I think that all of those 
pictures that they're taking, those are memories that they're going to have in the future. And those memories are just as important as the memories that we have uh, from our childhood, from Polaroids and um, the Kodak pictures and all that stuff. So I think that um, using Instagram as a social, um, to address the social needs is really good because uh, of the hashtag feature. You can look at all the different hashtags that they have and all that stuff. So I think that's good there too. Uh, here are some bonus links. Uh, I definitely have a lot more. Um, Storybird is, is great. Uh, I've used it with my students. Um, uh, with Lisa Dabbs on Edutopia, I did a um, blog post on Storybird. Symbolu is phenomenal. Um, I'm starting to use that more and more. Um, it's visual bookmarking, I think there's really good stuff there. Um, the third bullet point down, it's uh, an episode from This American Life on middle school. And um, I have to thank uh, Robert Greco Rogre on uh, Twitter for uh, telling me about this. And there's so much information that I wish teachers, parents, and teenagers themselves have that is packed into this episode. Um, it definitely is a must listen. Um, it's a free podcast. Um, just go on to the um, This American Life site and you can get it. Uh, I highly recommend it if you're a middle school teacher, even if you're an elementary school teacher. I think it's important to, to listen to this and high school teachers. Uh, you need to know what's happening. Uh, Wallwisher, um, I love Wallwisher, a lot of really good stuff there. Um, Yelp, uh, Yelp is always good, Yelp and Foursquare. And then uh, there's the National Novel Writing Month, NAMO, uh, NAMO uh, which is happening right now. And um, I have um, I have two students right now who are working on it. They're doing this uh, by themselves because they have a young writer's portion. Um, I know not many people realize that or know about it, um, but they have a youth, uh, a middle school version for, for students. And so I like to point my students to that as, as an option. Plus there's a lot of really good resources for your own classroom. So to uh, finish up here, uh, focus on the needs, not standards. Um, bring the humanity back to education and remember the developmental needs of, of students, the physical, intellectual, emotional, and social needs. And I can't promise if you do that, everything will be um, perfect, but it will help. Um, some of the things that I do on Wallwisher, um, I use um, I use Wallwisher for exit slips frequently. Um, one of the things that I have had issues with in the past is if I teach a new concept to students, um, let's say at 9 o'clock in the morning, um, and have them write an exit slip as a formative assessment, well, a lot of times the students are still struggling with it and trying to um, think it through. And so I, I don't think it's fair necessarily to expect them to write something down because a lot of middle school students, they take time to think and that's perfectly okay. So what happens then is I tell them, okay, sometime before midnight tonight or actually before class tomorrow, go on to Wallwisher and type up your exit slip. And um, it gives the students time because let's say a student is out at soccer practice and we're talking about uh, compare and contrast. And um, let's say they're using a white soccer ball and um, they kick the ball from the, the um, goalie box um, down to the midfield. And while the ball is traveling in the air, they could see the white ball against the blue sky and go, oh, that's contrast. Oh, I get it. And so then they can go home and type that up real quickly. Or let's say they're watching an episode of um, Arrested Development or whatever shows they're watching, and they can do that. Uh, so I think that if we use Wallwisher or Corkboard as uh, exit slips, that helps. Um, Yelp, I use Yelp and um, Foursquare sort of uh, for those students who have Foursquare. I use Yelp um, obviously for the reviews but also for them to see um, bias and uh, subjectivity and objectivity and um, that, hey, they may think 
this restaurant is the best thing in the world, but if they read a review of someone else, they may see that, oh, I haven't tried that thing or anything like that. Um, I don't think Wellwisher is iPad friendly. Uh, I'll have to double check. So I think it runs on um, Java. Uh, I could be wrong on that, but that's a great question, Carolyn. So um, I think that's my presentation. If you have any questions, I'm looking at the chat room now, and I'll be glad to help you out to the best of my ability. You know, although you're keeping track of the questions, um, was there anything else that uh, Stevens missed that you collected? Okay, go ahead. Yes, I have found some, Lorna. Um, going back to the beginning, it's, this question came up more than once, and probably everybody's still curious about it. Stephen, we want to know how you chose the name for your blog, Rush the Iceberg. <laughs> Uh, thanks for reminding me about that. I, I, <laughs> I've been meaning to do a blog post on that. Um, it's used in a few, di there's a few different meanings behind it. Uh, Rush is my absolute favorite band uh, for reasons that I can talk for five hours about. Also, the iceberg, um, I've always been fascinated with icebergs. But there's also another level of the iceberg in that um, when I was getting my bachelor's degree in English, um, I read a lot of essays about Ernest Hemingway and his um, I, the iceberg theory of his writing, where one-third of the iceberg is visible, two-thirds generally, and the iceberg is below the surface. And uh, when I got into teaching in the 90s, there was a lot of buzzwords about, oh, below the surface speaking or under the surface speaking and whatnot. And, um, so I just I really liked that where I tell my students, okay, let's strap on your goggles and your um, snorkels and wetsuit, and we're going to go under the iceberg and start you know looking at the nooks and crannies under the iceberg, and so going under um, going under the iceberg is is that deeper level of thinking, and then rush is also a verb where I want the students to to rush rush to the iceberg, at least get on the iceberg. Um, a lot of times, some of my students are nowhere near the iceberg. They're just out floating in the water somewhere. But if you're on that iceberg, there's um, a foundation to it. And um, they can um, stand on top of the uh, iceberg and look around, hang out with some of the penguins. Uh, but then they also need to go under and look at it. So there's a lot of different aspects of my uh, blog title. Thank you. Um, I think you an I answered the question about Wallwisher and Yelp examples, because um, you started yes. giving examples after that question came up. Uh, someone asked, I or said, I understand that Wallwisher is much more stable now. Is that true? Is Wallwisher more stable? Yes, I have, I have experienced that. Um, one of the reasons why I've, I've lessened my use of Wallwisher is uh, just pertains to my district. Seems like every other week they um, they block it, so I have mm -hmm. to email the district personnel and get it unblocked. So um, that's that's only that's been the only issue I have, but it definitely is much more stable. Thanks. Um, can you share some stories about the teachers' desk photos, and can people still contribute to them? Yes, absolutely. Thanks for asking about that. Um, a few years ago, I started it um, because I was thinking about how I'm always interested in what other teachers are doing. And I love reading other teachers' blogs and, and reading their Twitter um, portfolio or Twitter um, tweets. But I didn't think that that really, really gave me uh, an accurate picture of who they are as a teacher. And so I was thinking about it, and I thought about how a desk or the workspace that us teachers use really is a reflection of who we are. And um, one of the quotes that influenced me on this was James Joyce when he said that, in the particular, it contains the universal. And I started thinking about the desks on my campus and how there's vast differences, but also uh, very close similarities. And so I just wanted to um, see the desks of other teachers 
out there. And so I started this, and um, the first year was phenomenal. I had a really, really good um, response, and uh, I think we had close to 40 or 50 uh, teachers who were um, submitting on a regular basis. Um, then for a year or two, I kind of um, stopped doing it because um, my children were born, so I was kind of busy. But now, now that um, my boy is one year old and my girl is three year old, three years old, um, I have a little more time, so I set it up on a Tumblr to where uh, other teachers can email. So if you're interested, which I hope you are, um, please direct message me on Twitter, and I'll send you um, a link with all the directions and the email uh, for the Tumblr. And I want to also stress that it doesn't have to be a desk. I've had some teachers um, who said, oh, I've ditched my desk. Okay, well, where do you, and I, I don't mean to be snarky here, but where do you grade your papers? Where do you read, where do you lesson plan? Where do you take role? Um, so it's been really nice to see some of the teachers. They've um, posted pictures of their, um, of their couch. And they grade papers. That's their that's their desk, basically. Uh, I've had a teacher post stuff about their um, on their their kitchen counter. Um, Robert Greco, road grade, he posted a picture from the library. Um, and so the desk is really just a metaphor for wherever you get your work done. And um, so it doesn't don't be misled by the name. Uh, the desk is more of a metaphor for where you get all your stuff done. So definitely check it out. I uh, would love, ha love to have many people submit stuff. Um, and it's just fascinating to look at the desks of other teachers. Uh, you get some great ideas, and you can see that you're not alone in your um, neuroses and in your, your joys and happiness. Thank you. Uh, the next question I captured was, do you use Twitter in your classroom? I wish I could use Twitter in my classroom. My district has it blocked. Ah. Like, like it sounds like a lot of schools do. Uh, have you tried yeah. Linoit? No, I haven't, but I've written it down, and mm -hmm. I'm definitely looking forward to um, checking that out. Uh, do students have their own devices in your classes? Many of them do. Many of my students do. And um, right now they're, they've been working on a project, a um, paper blogging from Notes from McTeach, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. um, one of my, they're writing about cell phone use in school. And um, I printed out a copy of uh, Vicki Davis's uh, cool cat teacher blog post about using cell phones in the schools, and then a couple articles from The Wire and uh, Atlantic Monthly, and then also my principal emailed to show her her thoughts on it. And so my students took all that information and they're creating their own blog posts. Long story short, three students came up and said, "Hey, Mr. Davis, can we do a vlog about it? A video blog?" I'm like, oh, absolutely. So they went around and they took pictures and video of teachers using their cell phones. And then they came into one of my different classes and uh, took pictures and videos of students trying to sneak it in. And what the students mm -hmm. said they're going to do is when the teachers are using the cell phone, that's going to be all in color with like halo effects. But then where the teachers are using, or the students are using the um, cell phones, it's going to be in black and white to show the difference there. And so um, I thought that that was really cool. But I would say three quarters of my students have a smartphone. The other don't have it. Um, I'm in a middle school district, or in a, um, uh, um, gosh, we're, we're in suburbia, in, in suburbia, and there's, people who have a lot of money and people who don't have any money at all. So not everybody has access to a smartphone. And I found that a lot of my students, they'll, they get their phone taken away from their parents. So I can't really rely on having it there. Um, but my principal and the district and everything, we've, we've, I've, I found some wiggle room for my students to be able to use their devices more frequently in, in class. And I'm looking forward to doing that. Good. 
Uh, the only last question I have is, are you influenced by customer reviews for either apps or tools? I'd like to say no, <laughs> uh, but no, I make all my own decisions. I'm not influenced by anyone. <laughs> But I think that that's a bunch of hogwash, and anyone who says differently is is pretty disingenuous. Um, I'm definitely influenced by reviews, um, definitely on on Yelp and Foursquare and on mm -hmm. you know, Amazon and and iTunes. Um, but I'm also there's there's probably five or six people on on Twitter who, if they recommend an app, pretty much no questions asked. I'm going to go and get that. And mm -hmm. nine point eight times out of ten, I'm able to use that app, and it becomes one of my favorite apps and whatnot. Um, so I think it's important to read the the reviews, um, if only to see if there's um, stability issues or difficulties with some of like you know maybe the the iPad or iPhone crashes and whatnot, just to kind of get a general view. Um, I tend personally to make a lot of my decisions based on the screenshots that the developer provides. Um, I guess I'm more visual in that way. Thank you. Those are the last ones that I have for questions. At this point, I, I've given Paula uh, mic access. If she wants to come to the mic and ask her question, make a comment, please feel free to do it. Paula, your, your mic's active. Hi everyone. Uh, Stephen, thank you for everything you shared. Uh, I am not a middle school teacher. I'm an elementary school teacher, but it's always nice to hear what's going on in other classrooms. And I just wanted to share with everyone in the room that I'm um, running a blog project for December 12, 2012. And I had dropped the link in the chat room, and here it is again. Uh, for those of you that would like to participate, it can be done on a classroom blog, a teacher blog, or individual student blogs. And on that day, every child, every student is going to blog about their tw 12 favorite things. So please feel free to join us. Stephen, I hope you get some of your kids involved. And it will be fun to see what happens. Right now, I just have the sign-up sheet. I'll be creating a Google Doc for the URLs to be added as we get closer to that day. Thank you so much. Thanks, Paula. And just one more question in the chat. They're just asking what you teach in middle school. I believe it's English. Is that correct? Yes, eighth grade English. Um, I spent a year teaching high school, um, and I loved it. I thought that that's what I wanted to do. I loved teaching Catcher on the Rye and Hamlet and all that, and then um, my mentor, she ended up transferring to a junior high, and um, I was able to get a job there, and because uh, I really wanted to work with her, and I, I fell in love with middle school junior high kids, um, so I never want to go anywhere else. Um, middle middle school students, they're uh, they're a roller coaster, but they're so much fun, and they keep me on my toes, and they're an accurate reflection of who I am as a person as far as all the weirdness and craziness and emotional and all that stuff. So I, I think it's, it's just awesome. I, I love teaching junior high. I have no desire to be anywhere else. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Laurie. I appreciate you collecting the questions for us. I'm just getting close to the end of the show. There is a couple in there about um, college students joining. Oh, that's about the project, though. And quad blogging. Peggy was asking if you have used quad blogging. Um, I have no idea what quad blogging is. Um, I'm curious. But can anybody tell me more about it? Who is the expert there wants to come? Quad blogging. There's Jan sh sharing the link with you. Someone want to come okay. to the mic and talk about it? Jen's just telling you she, we participated in for four days. You're talking about four classrooms. I'm not familiar with it myself either. OK, that's what I thought something to do with that. Yeah, it, it looks interesting. Um, 
I'm, I'm definitely going to read up more more on it after the presentation. Um, one of the things that I do like is William Chamberlain's comments for kids. Uh, he has a, a website and a um, hashtag on Twitter where um, they promote um, the blogs of students and um, commenting on it. So comments for t um, comments for kids is is a really cool uh, hashtag on Twitter. Thank you. Just uh, Peggy was making a suggestion about shambles coming to the mic and talking about, and I've lost track of where that is. But shambles, you're always welcome to come to the mic there. But your presentation with BPNs. Do you want to say anything about it? If that's the case, I'll give you mic access. I've lost sight of you though. There you are. So you do have okay. mic access. Yeah, I'm here. I'm. Uh, I hope there's no feedback. Don't talk. Uh, no, I'm you're not using good. Headset. I'm not using headset. So uh, on Wednesday, and I think the time is. <laughs> you're not going to like this. It's four o'clock Thailand time. I think it's about eight o'clock Australian time. Um, I'm having a one-hour session in a series in Australia. In fact, they have they have some great series down there. They have one on a Tuesday, one on a Wednesday, one on a Thursday. And I'm spending an hour next Wednesday in the Australia series, and it's just called a fire t fireside chat about the iPad. But one one of the things I'm going to do is talk about VPNs, which are virtual private networks, and that's a way of getting over firewalls or blockages, um, and also make connections more secure. And I'll just drop the URL. It's not uh, the session actually isn't on the Australian series blog just yet, but I'll drop it in there and you can have a look if you're interested in, in coming. Thanks for the opportunity to let people know. Thank you very much, Stephen. So I think we've got most of the questions and comments answered. I am going to close out the show. We only have a few more minutes and in doing so I express my appreciation to you, Stephen, for an excellent presentation today. Uh, giving you a heads up, uh, most of you have uh, been familiar with the Global Education Conference that's been going on all week and uh, here's a link to the recordings, uh, tinyurlgec 2012 recordings and I think you'll have a great time going back and uh, uh, reviewing the presentations. Coming up uh, November the 20th, Tuesday, is Kiran Birsafi on teaching kids to take charge on future of education conversations. Uh, Thursday, November 27th, we have Charles Hayes on September University. And November 29th, Thursday, we have Jim Groom on a domain of one's own. Worthwhile presentations to attend. And for our upcoming shows, um, just take note that we'll have no show next weekend in uh, uh, celebration of Thanksgiving holiday in the United States. Uh, December 1st, we have uh, John Herbert from Avon Maitland uh, District School Board here in Ontario talking about math and he did an excellent presentation in Night Parents explaining to how he teaches math in the classroom. December 8th, our featured teacher will be Karen Litterman and iPads in grade one classrooms. So some great speakers coming up in the near future. So nominating a featured teacher, we're still looking for those nominations and uh, there's the link for the uh, form for you to fill out to suggest someone who'd be a good uh, presenter for us and uh, if you missed that link, remember in the live binder we have all our resources and links to um, the different features that we provide for you, including this one, the uh, survey which we ask you to fill out near the end of the show. Well, we when you log out and cl or close your Blackboard Collaborate window, you'll get a, a pop-up window with the survey. And if you don't get it, please don't worry about it because it is, again, in the live binder under Classroom to Zero Live Resources. And that's noteworthy because in this survey is access to the Professional Development Certificate, which we submit. Um, Submit your name, and we'll provide you a link. Um, excuse me, a survey. And again, if you don't get that link, it, it's back in our live, live binder. And a special thanks to Peggy, who does this every week, kind of collating the applications for the survey and sending them out in a timely fashion. So if you don't get it, please go to the live binders and submit the survey. And if any problems, we do have a website. Excuse me, an email address live 
at classroom20.com is our email address. Reminder, we do have an iTunes U channel with a video and audio collection for you. And uh, the link for that will be in the live binder. You can access our RSS feed using uh, the link in the blog post in archives and resources. What are the great things we have to, to do? Uh, special thanks to Stephen again for his presentation, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 20, who's been a, a great uh, mentor and uh, pusher in pr providing us with access to uh, Teacher 20, Future of Education, and Web 20 classes. We thank Webly, Weebly for providing our website and for all of you who are able to attend. Uh, today's session and to Blackboard Collaborate for providing us the room in which we meet every Saturday. Except next Saturday we'll be celebrating uh, Thanksgiving. Oh, what, what number it is? Shambles? Gee, I can't remember what number we are. I think we, we passed the 50 a long time ago. So, I don't know. Peggy, we've been keeping track of how many shows we are. We did. We counted it once, but shambles will go back and count them all up and see how great they are. But we are looking forward to the beginning of the year to our, our um, a SmackDown for the year. So it's um, going to be a fun session. Yes, we've been here 2009. 100 coming up. You know what? I don't remember the average forged about four years. And um, We didn't do 52 for four, so we've been past 100, I'm sure. Who knows? We'll just have a big celebration. So again, thank you, everyone, for being with us today. A little nonsense going on at the end of the show here. And Stephen, uh, much appreciated for all your work today. And with that, I'm going to thank everyone for being with us today. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks.